Well, after watching yet another video where somebody has used hundreds of watts of solar to power hundreds of amp hours worth of batteries on their Sprinter van, I finally decided that I needed to make something because I hate seeing people waste their money like that. This is my van. As you can see, I've got two panels up there. It's 200 watts. It's more than enough to recharge what I have down below, which is a house battery set of two Trojan 105 batteries for about 220 amp hours of power. These are flooded lead acid batteries. They're as low tech as you can get, and they last forever if you take good care of them. My last set that I had lasted me 10 years before I sold that trailer. Uh, they, they literally are just bomb proof. They're six volt golf cart batteries. They are designed for these type of operations and they're just phenomenal. Uh, because they're six volt, you do need to run them in series, so you need to buy them in even numbers, so two, or if you really think you need it, four. Honestly, I can't imagine many people would even need four of these. I will say before we get started that because they are flooded batteries, they do off-gas hydrogen when they're being charged, so you do need to vent the battery compartment. I have a positive ventilation system that I've rigged up using simple computer fans. Now, a lot of people, when I tell them that I'm only running two Trojan 105s, they'll often say, oh, well, you don't have very many electrical loads then. Your camper's kind of sparse or whatever. No, absolutely not. I've got a Max Air. I've got the largest fridge that Engel Coolers makes. Uh, I believe it's at 84 quart. I've got a microwave. I've got a precision temp water heater. I've got running hot and cold water. I've got lights throughout the van. I've got exterior lights at the rear for the cargo, and I have exterior lights at the side. In addition, I also have a stereo system, including a DVD player, an extra TV that mounts over by the microwave, and a 10-inch subwoofer. So when you get started, the first thing you're going to want to do is go through all of your equipment and try to figure out how many amps it's going to draw. Um, you know, you can use manufacturer specs, but I prefer to actually use a multimeter. Uh, hook it up for an hour, or even better, multiple hours, and then divide that into the 24-hour day. So here's me testing out my fridge. Now the specs on this angle fridge said it pulled 4 amps. In actuality, it pulls 4 amps when the compressor first starts, but it only runs about every 12 minutes or so. Anyway, and uh, the end result is, is I only pull about 1.2 amps per hour with this fridge. Next thing you want to do is figure out your solar array. I'm using these Renogy panels, which I believe are about $90 uh, for each panel on Amazon. They're 100 watt panels. These things are absolutely fantastic. I can't say enough good things about them. They don't have the highest output for panels. However, what they do have that I just discovered by accident is their low light performance is phenomenal. I've actually seen that I can still make power even well after the sun has gone down. Most mornings by the time I wake up, and I wake up pretty early, my batteries are already up above 90%. I went ahead and riveted these onto the roof rack. Um, I prefer the riveted uh, installation just because I figure it's a lot harder to steal them that way. Not everybody's gonna have a drill on them. Underneath my fridge here, you can see my charge controller. Now, solar installations generally fail because of two things, wire gauge and incorrect charge controller settings. Charge controllers, by default, all come with very, very benign settings. Um, these settings are based on what you would want if you had a vehicle alternator that's running for as long as the vehicle is running, and it'll charge at that particular voltage. Um, they're extremely conservative so that they won't cook your batteries. The problem is they're too conservative. They never even charge your battery up completely because usually with a quote-unquote professional installation, at least every one that I've seen, the installers use usually 10 gauge wire, if that, oftentimes even worse, and the line voltages, uh, while 3% drops on a line is perfectly acceptable for, for running certain equipment, when you're talking about the low amounts of power that are created with solar, this really adds up quickly. And then you have this charge controller that's using those voltages to determine what uh, what charge rate it's going to be at. The end result is is that your batteries never get full. So what I've done is uh, on the program for the charge controller, and and I think just about 
And most charge controllers have some sort of, of control. And it's usually just a little dial or a switch or you know, it might be a push button where you get the lights to blink different to get to the different modes. I have this on the most aggressive setting that you can get with this thing. And in two years, I've had to add water to my batteries three times. It's not cooking my batteries. I'm also using eight gauge wire. Um, I believe it's actually rated for six, but I was able to squeeze eight into there. The other thing you wanna do is you wanna make sure that the charge controller is mounted as absolutely close to your batteries as humanly possible. Now, um, this also brings into question a, a, an issue with uh, explosion. You know, like I mentioned earlier, we have the hydrogen gas. You don't want one of these things sitting there in the same compartment as your batteries, ideally. So what I've got is, that's why it's on this other panel on the outside of the battery box. All of the wires go through that hole there. And then I've sealed up that hole with spray foam so that it's all nice and airtight. None of that uh, hydrogen gas is getting in here. What else can you do? That's basically, that's gonna take care of 90% of your problems. Uh, wire gauge and getting that charge controller as close to the batteries as possible. Um, the distance between, if you've got a lot, whatever the run is from your panels to your charge controller, you wanna make sure that charge controller is, the, the run is in between the panels and the charge controller. Um, ideally you want everything as close as possible, but you know, you're gonna have to make that length somehow. Better to do it between the panel and the charge controller. Keep that distance as short as possible between the controller and the batteries. All right, from there, it really comes down to what you do in the construction. Uh, first and foremost, insulation makes a very big difference. It'll keep it cooler in the summer and hotter in the winter. I had some extra insulation. This is 3M Thinsulate. I went ahead and I wrapped it around my fridge as well. Uh, I'm going to point out just because people are probably going to say something in the comments. Uh, all of this stuff did get strapped down. It is all very secure. It's not moving anywhere. Um, the batteries have a pin mechanism uh, so that they're on, a, they're on a sliding drawer, but it's all pinned in place and, and locked there. So I have to, it's not easy to undo and then I can, well, it's, it's easy, but it's not gonna come undone accidentally and I can just slide the batteries out for maintenance. Anyway, insulating the fridge makes it run a little bit less time. Uh, right here, these are my water pump and accumulator. That uh, black device on the floor there on the right next to the water tank, the 25 gallon water tank, that's my water pump. Then to the left of it is a water accumulator. And what this does is it keeps pressure on the system and sort of stores it. So essentially what happens is I can run about uh, half a quart of water through the faucet before the pump even turns on. It doesn't sound like much, but you'd be amazed at how many times you just do a quick rinse of something. And those water pumps use a lot of power. I think they draw about three, four amps or so. So just saving a little bit there saves a lot of energy. Uh, one of the big things you can do is on your lights, put individual switches on them. Uh, this is one of my panels. You'll see that each of those lights has a switch next to it. Here's a close up of it installed. Obviously I haven't removed the protective plastic yet. And here you can see the roof line with all of the switches next to the lights. What I find is that uh, I have one main switch by the door. Um, I turn that on and the lights come on just as normal. But out of the 10 lights that I have mounted in this van, I don't think I've ever operated more than three at a time. Um, you know, they're LEDs, so they're very efficient, but what's more efficient than 10 LEDs? Three LEDs. One of the other big things you can do, and I see people make this mistake a lot, is they run all of their electronics on their AC inverter. Uh, this is a huge mistake. Inverters use about 40% more power than if you power it with DC. So you're taking DC and you're having to convert it to AC. Well, just turning on an inverter uh, my 2000 watt inverter draws one amp just being on, not even using it. So I keep it off all the time. The only thing my inverter is used for is the microwave and occasionally power tools when I'm doing some sort of project on the side of the van. The rest of the time I use these little outlets here that I got off of Amazon for about five bucks each. They have a cigarette lighter adapter as well as two USB plugs, a 2.0 amp and a 1.0 amp. Now, what this allows me to do is to charge my DC devices like laptops and a phone off of DC. It saves 40% of the power right off the bat. Anyway, in addition, it's usually quicker. So I'm not running the inverter at an amp, and then I'm also charging my devices faster using DC. I think a, uh, all of my camera batteries and such, 
Um, I got chargers for them. They were about 10 bucks each on Amazon. The one for my laptop, I think was about $30. Uh, pays for itself very quickly. So that's about it. You do those little steps right there and you too can have a Sprinter van that sips electricity and you can save all that money and roof space on not having to put a bunch of solar up there.